Hello everyone and welcome to Shelved. Now a couple episodes ago we looked at a Spider-Man movie written by Andrew Kevin Walker from the early 90s and today we have another Andrew Kevin Walker script. I have a feeling he's going to become an all-star appearance on Shelved because he's he's worked on a lot of scripts, he's done a lot of uncredited work and just a lot of old superhero movies that never got made. And I know those are all going to, I have scripts for all those, and those are all going to come up on the show at some point. So I just hats off to this guy for giving us so much content. You might know him as the writer of Seven by David Fincher, and he's also worked on a couple other high profile movies. But we looked at a Spider Man movie, which was pretty similar to the movie that ended up coming out. This time we're going to look at one of his movies that is completely different from what eventually came out, and that is his script for X Men, written in 1994. Now, the story goes, um, the company that owned the rights to Spider-Man in the early 90s also owned the rights to X-Men, and they had approached James Cameron to direct X-Men, and they had a meeting, and they were talking about X-Men, and then Spider-Man came up, and then they started talking about Spider-Man and explaining it to James Cameron, and there was a quote from somebody, some someone relayed this to me from another podcast, I don't know what podcast it is, uh, but basically that... When they started explaining to Spider-Man to James Cameron, it was, oh, James Cameron doesn't want to make a Spider-Man movie anymore, or uh, an X-Men movie anymore. He wants to make a Spider-Man movie. So James Cameron moved on to Spider-Man, and X-Men just kind of fell to the wayside until eventually that company went under and the rights went all over the place. So this was the script that originally was going to be offered to James Cameron, and it's a very interesting X-Men script. It's really interesting to think of it as... X-Men in the early 90s with like where movie technology was at that time where would what would this have looked like I know we were past Terminator 2 which had definitely made some progression in the CG world but it was still you know very early very basic stuff like the T-1000 there was a reason why he looked the way he did because it was easy to do but I mean I would have loved to have seen an early 90s X-Men movie this script is very different from the movie that eventually came out and I will say the movie that came out stays more true to the tone and the story of the comics, but I would have liked to have seen this movie made. Like I I could easily imagine a world where this movie was made and then in 2000 they had rebooted the franchise, but um, it's an interesting read and it's always interesting. I'm fascinated by the late eighties, early nineties superhero scripts. Cause I mean, Batman, but in 89 changed everything and it became possible. I mean, Superman movies had already existed, but Batman kind of grounded it. And it's interesting to see like, Oh, there was a ton of different superhero movies that were going to be made afterwards because of the success of Batman. And I, I love reading these and there's more to come. And there's even, I there's so many superhero scripts. I'm trying not to do only superhero scripts, but I give my guests a list of scripts, and they pick the ones they want to do, and they often end up picking uh, superhero movies. But I'm trying to, you know, get a little variety in there. But um, I sat down with Maggie, who had been on the Star Wars episode, because she is my resident X-Men expert. Um, we were both huge comic book fans, but X-Men has always been kind of a blind spot for me in my comic knowledge. I have read some X-Men stories. Over the last year, I've been trying to really expand my knowledge on X-Men, and I've been buying a lot more of their comics and kind of going back and reading some of the bigger stories. So she's kind of the one I go to for X-Men stuff. So when I found this script, I knew that she would be the perfect person to bring on for this. So I really hope you enjoy the episode. I thought it was an interesting conversation. Um. Yeah, it's 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 X Men like you have never seen on screen before, and it really would have been an interesting movie. The cast of characters was interesting, and I would, I just can't even imagine who in the early '90s you would have cast in these roles. But it's it's fun to think about, and I really hope you guys enjoy this episode. X Men is a fun one, and Andrew Kevin Walker, we're we're definitely gonna see you again. So. This is X-Men from 1994 with my friend and returning guest, Maggie.
action X-Men. To me, I don't remember when it was on, but I was a Spider-Man kid. And I think X-Men was on before Spider-Man, so I was like, oh, let's just get this show over with so I can watch Spider-Man. I had a really terrifying moment as a child where um, we had a really, really old TV that was really crackly and like had a knob. <laughs> yeah. And it, but we kept it in the basement because it was the old shitty TV. And that's where I'd go down and sneak to watch cartoons in the morning, not wake my parents up. And it was an episode of X-Men with Phoenix. Yeah. And... She like rose and she's like, I am Phoenix or something to that effect. And then the TV popped and oh, turned geez. off. And it was like 6 a.m. <laughs> totally dark and watching X-Men. Uh, it was so freaky. I love those old TVs. I was just like, what the hell? Yeah. See, I didn't. I caught episodes of the cartoon, but yeah. it just wasn't what I liked at the time. I didn't get into X-Men until the movies. That's when and, I like really got into them. Yeah. I would yeah. watch the cartoons here and there. And I, I that memory really sticks out to me. But. I got into X Men with the movies. Yeah, and even the first movie didn't because I I look at the first movie as like it's kind of boring. Like it's okay as far as comic book movies at the time, it was very well made and mm-hmm. stuff. But it was X two that I'm like, all right, I'm I'm in on X Men. That's a, like the, another very odd, vivid X Men memory I have is seeing the trailer for X two. I didn't even see X Men when it was out in theaters. I don't think just yeah, wasn't my on radar. VHS. And I saw the commercial. For X2 coming out on DVD for some reason. And it really stuck out to me. So and you I, didn't even see the second one in, in theaters? In theaters, no. No. See, and I saw it in theaters. And I, I saw the first one, and I didn't see any trailers or anything for the second one. Mm-hmm. And my brother's just like, oh, do you want to go see the new X-Men movie? And I just love going to the movies in general. I was like, yeah, sure. And it was like in the middle, of, like in the theater, I remember watching that Nightcrawler scene in the beginning. And I'm just like, I'm in on this yeah. movie. Yeah, but, I so the trailer got to me, and I had to see it. And I rented x Want the first one and the second one. Yeah. Saw them same weekend, and then I went to the library and got every X Men comic they carried. So I, just, I was in. I was one hundred percent. Yeah, because you're 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 the person I go to about my X Men stuff. Because yeah. I've I've read very little X Men. I've I've seen all the movies except I haven't seen the second Wolverine movie. That, it's good. I still hold up that really? that one's good. Yeah, I've heard I've, it's better. I hated the first one. Like there's parts of it I like. I'll say. I like the, the the overall story, and mm-hmm. I like ele- like parts of it, but there's some really bad CG in that movie. There's some real bad like cramming in of characters that just don't belong there. Yeah. And the way it fits in the timeline, which all of those movies are kind of crazy about the timeline. The first one, that was the one that had alternate endings. Yes. Uh, after the credit scene, and I saw it three times in the first week. To really? See to all... see all the different endings? Mm-hmm. That was something I didn't know. For I was one of those people that watched the work print version of that movie. Like, mm. here's the version without the special effects. I didn't see the actual movie till like, four years afterwards. And when I owned the Blu-ray, I got it for, like, $2 or something. And that's when I finally watched the full version of the movie. It came out on my 18th birthday. And that's what I did for my wow, 18th really? birthday. Yeah. Man. <laughs> Is that that long ago? Yeah, it had, yeah, because it was, yeah, it was Man, right before I started getting my for, I mean, I guess the first one came out in like 2000, 2001, somewhere in that range. That, oh. it's one of those things because I didn't see it then, I yeah. can't place it exactly, but it had to be around then, and then I probably started watching around like 2003, and that just got me into comics entirely, American comics at least. Yeah, yeah, see, I, I, I still only just recently started getting into X-Men comics, and I, I kind of went to you, like, where should I start? And because like there's so many different versions, and you've pointed me to the Joss Whedon stuff, which I've started. Yeah, that I think is it's a good entry point if you know enough about X Men that you don't need to like you yeah. know if you've seen the movies that you know enough about the characters but yeah. you want to get into something newer. I find that to be a solid entry point than the ultimate. Yeah, I really like ultimate. You were lending me those books, and I actually mm-hmm. picked one up recently. They had a sale, and they had one of the volumes on sale. I'm like, yeah, this is I'm pretty sure where I left off from what you lent me. I really do like ultimate, but mm-hmm. I, I kind of like ultimate for all that stuff. Yeah, that's that's also where. It became more accessible to me because I would just like yeah. I just I got mean, that random. was their goal with the Ultimate Universe is to introduce new readers and make it more accessible, and it worked for me for a lot of those characters. Mm-hmm. But uh, the X Men we're here to talk about is from 1994, which I don't know where X Men was at that time. Um, as far as like the 90s, like I know a lot of the classic X Men stuff comes from the 60s, so I don't know where they were in the 90s is in terms of like, oh, who are the popular characters and stuff like yes. that. So I've read so many of the comics, but my timeline is really fuzzy mostly because I just would read them completely out of order. And obviously I read them yeah, in the 2000s. Yeah, you kind of just read what you yeah. get. Especially because I was like going through my library until finally they they had a DVD, a, a, like a CD disc that you could put on your computer and it gave me PDFs of like 60 really? years of X-Men 
comics. That's crazy. It was awesome. Something like that nowadays would be totally unheard of. I mean, now you got the apps and stuff that you can buy. I can go and buy the very first issue of X-Men on my app, but... Yeah, they had a a DVD that was 40 years of the X-Men. You got PDFs of all the comics, and they were like... Not even good scans of some of them. Oh, yeah. I but mean, it was an official thing. And like you, they had the great like not ads in them and everything. It was, really? It was so awesome. cool. I love... That's one of my favorite things about old comics is just like the, the ads and things like that. Crazy ads. Um, but yeah. Um, I, yeah. I, my, my relationship to X-Men is definitely more related to the movies. I'm kind of more of the, I guess, cl- classic comic book fan nowadays of like, oh, the movies really introduced me to a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. Like I read Days of Future Past when Days of Future Past was coming out. And I was talking to you earlier today and I'm like, yeah, that old X-Men stuff is kind of hard for me to get through. And I prefer the more 90s to 2000s era stuff. Yeah, it's funny because the uh, time that I got into X-Men, it was definitely more... Um, a couple of the artists were definitely more anime inspired and that's actually what I was yeah. reading at the time. So that kind of helped me get into it and then, you know, it was my desire I, to go back. That- that's definitely the kind of art style I lean towards. The guy who did, not not the current run of Spider-Man, but the previous run before they rebranded again for the second time, very anime art style and it's probably one of my favorite art styles to go with Spider-Man and that would definitely pull me into X-Men as well. It's why I like Ultimate is because the art style is a little more contemporary yeah. and stuff like that. In the in the writing, because that old that old comic book writing, so many words, just so expositional, yeah, and it just really drags it down for me. Um, but let's 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 jump into this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I immediately, like I said, you're the resident uh, X Men fan that I know, so I immediately when I found this, I was like, this is the perfect one for you. And how how did you find it? Like overall, like it's a very basic x-men story i think yeah it's the it's the quintessential x-men you start with the five x-men the five original x-men plus yeah. wolverine yeah and, and then the the cast of x-men overall not just x-men but the brotherhood as well i was actually kind of surprised by like the fact that they included juggernaut was... i was surprised that they included juggernaut and blob in the brotherhood yeah just because they're they, kind of the same character. They fill a lot of the same purpose on a team, and they're also just big guys, and they both say the same thing. Like, they can't be moved. They can't. They do the same. Yeah, and honestly, Juggernaut doesn't do much in the movie until the end. Like, I doesn't. almost forgot he was there. I mean, yeah. the Brotherhood in general is kind of just in the shadows for a good point of the movie. Yeah, they um, they don't... They have a... you. They're really introduced before you're introduced to the X-Men, which yeah. I thought was strange. Yeah, the, well, the first character we get introduced to is Logan. Who's yes. in a suit, which already is kind of everyone's in suits. Yeah, it's... they keep saying like so and so in a suit, Toad yeah. in a suit. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, they they really talk a lot about the wardrobe of the movie, but not like their costumes in particular. No, they everyone's say they're wearing in armor. suits or body armor. Those yes. are the two options: suits yeah. or body armor. And I'm pretty sure we get Beast in like a suit, mm-hmm. like multiple yeah. times. And yeah, so we're first introduced to Logan in like kind of an opening action scene. They're in, I assume it's somewhere in Canada, I think they say. Mm-hmm. And he's working for Department H, which I asked you, is that if, did, you, is. did you find something I've, about this? I can't believe I totally forgot. Department H is Alpha Flight. Okay. See, this is touching into knowledge that I had just do and not have in X-Men. James Hudson, who he talks to, is um, who is the his connection. Oh, so he's a character from the comics yes, as well. Yes, he's okay. Guardian, the guy with the big maple leaf oh, okay. costume. Yeah, I yeah know big him. red and white, yeah. So they're alpha fl- that that's what Department H was. It was driving me crazy because I couldn't. Yeah, because quite... I asked you, I was like, is this something from the comics? Because in any of the comics I've read, it's I've never heard of it before. Yeah, because well, that's kind of is Wolverine's origin story that he is working for Alpha Flight and okay because they're, they they seem to be in the in the script kind of implied to be like Canadian Secret Service basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're the and then they turn into the Canadian superhero team. Not seen this movie at all, but yeah, there's some of that there. Yeah, but that that's interesting then because that's like a little world building which. You you see in some comic book movies that weren't tied to like a big universe because now we got the whole Marvel universe thing and now the DC universe thing, excuse me. And it's like it's world building. You you kind of get hints at in those older comic book movies like Batman Forever when they name drop Metropolis for like yeah. two seconds. Like I like that kind of stuff. There was some of that I didn't like um, when we first meet Sabretooth. Um, or not maybe when we first meet him, but when he me- talks to Logan, yeah, he says. I can't even remember why you hate me. Yeah. And then he goes, oh, yeah, I killed the love of your life. Never yeah. brought up again. I Sabretooth is kind of a conflict for me overall in the script because every line he has is really bad. It's all, yeah. It's real cheesy. Like, there's actually some really good dialogue in the script. I was really surprised as I was reading through 
and a lot of the dialogue with like Xavier and Magneto, there's some there's some good stuff in there. Um, but most of the other characters, it's kind of what you would expect. Like Cyclops and Logan basically fill the same role that they do in the movies that we did get. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the, there, there's a scene in particular I want to talk about later that kind of drags down the movie for me involving them. But yeah, I mean, the, the Sabretooth just the entire time is spouting off really terrible bad guy lines and very yeah. stereotypical like ha, ha ha I'm beating you like from across the room type situations. Yeah, the dialogue was pretty good. There was a couple points where there were some like words maybe because it was na- 90s that kind of yeah. stuck out to me. Um and some stuff was a little heavy-handed. There's the um again, also early in the movie there's a news report talking cuz right now we're in it's a, again a classic X Men story. Yeah, they're registering mutants. Yes, like right off the bat, it's the f- like the first thing in the script. All mutants must register. Yeah, and they're, they're blurring it all out of yeah. a car. To me, there's always two X like mutant storylines that are very seem to be very popular in X Men. It's either mutants are registering mm-hmm. or there might be a cure. Yes, and I was not surprised at all to see the registering pop up immediately. The thing that was a little heavy handed is that. Right off, because you got registering, and the whole thing is like the common viewers should know registering leads to worse things. You know, it's not just registering. Yeah, but they straight up announced, "Let's put them in camps and and yes, tattoo and give them." Give them tattoos. And I was like, I was, I fucking <laughs> dropped my iPad and put my hands on my head, and I was just like, "No, like, <laughs> let's also be Nazis." The guys said, yeah, like, right like, <laughs> they literally just like, yeah, we should be Nazis. Yeah, it was. It was. <laughs> I'm like, fucking blew me away. I understand this is the '90s. Things were very different than than people a lot more sensitive now, but holy shit! They even just then, punch them in the nose with Nazis or anything. Yeah, like, and like, this oh. is a guy who. So in the first X Men movie, the one that came out, mm-hmm. we have this whole storyline with a politician who's very much against mutants, and then the Brotherhood like basically kidnaps this dude and turns him into a mutant, and like it's kind of woven into the main story of the movie. In this, we get kind of a similar character who's the guy that's saying that we should register. tattoo them and register them and put them in camps. And he's just kind of in and out. And I feel like there were, they definitely could have leaned more on that stuff in this script. Like there's a lot of talk about registering in the first few pages. And then that stuff just kind of goes to the wayside a little bit. Yeah. It's a motivation for the brotherhood. Yeah. Um, but we don't get it. We don't get enough interaction between humans and mutants. Almost not the military mutants we get some of. Yeah, a little bit. But yeah, no human mutant. Yeah, like yeah, and like you said, at the beginning it's a lot of introducing the Brotherhood first. Like the first character we we get Logan first, and he has his little action scene, and then we get the Blob at a circus freak show. Mm-hmm. Which to me, it's like we're in a world where everybody knows that mutants exist. Like, why would a freak show even be entertaining to people? And he's really just a fat guy. Like, what yeah, he does yeah. in there is really kind of just be a fat guy, too. He's like, everyone's like shocked. He's like 500 pounds. I'm like, yo, watch yeah. TLC reality TV shows now. Like, yeah. And yeah. So, like, welcome to X Men, the reality show. Yeah. And yeah, we kind of just get like a lot of recruitment from Magneto in the beginning. So, we get Blob, we get Toad, um, like we said, uh, Juggernaut. Juggernaut. And then Sabretooth. Is that it for the Brotherhood? That's it. Yeah. Yeah, and Dude then our me. core X Men team, we got Cyclops, we got Gene, we got Beast, we got Iceman, and then Logan, right? Oh, Angel. and Angel. Who doesn't do much in this movie? No, and they actually kind of are a dick to him at one point. Like They are. They're like, hey, you're kind of you're, off the team, just stay in the car. Yeah, like you're going to be the pilot, is what he is. It was a weird, like, thing to announce. Yeah. And, I didn't understand, like, oh, yeah, you're not really part of this mission, go sit over there. And I was yeah. like, and Xavier's hmm. kind of an asshole in this kind of oh, like classic. Yeah, I mean he he's it's definitely like tough love, but yeah, yeah he's basically just like yeah, Angel, you're kind of useless because like they so we we get introduced to the Brotherhood and then we get the scene where they're breaking out Juggernaut and this is our introduction to the X Men, which is it's it's an it's a decent opening scene like a decent opening yeah. action scene, but it is kind of far in the movie if you ask. Yeah, a I mean, bit. I mean, I know we've met Wolverine, but just because we're seeing all it's. It's weird that we see a villain origin 
story without a hero yeah. origin kind of yeah we, we get introduced to all the villains and then they're breaking out ju juggernaut and then the x-men just appear and we don't know who they are is i mean we know who they are but we've gotten no introduction to them mm -hmm. and the only way we're learning who they are is like they're shouting out names to each other which which is fine that's kind of movie making one does not even get marvel girl in this movie she is Jean. see the, and that was a thing that as a younger comic book reader i didn't even really know her as marvel girl that was something yeah. i learned way later but yeah, she's just... Because they drop it move. very fast, I feel like. But it's just yeah. odd in this... It stands out because it's not explained and everyone else has code names but her. Yeah, and it is one of those things that even nowadays when it pops up in the comics, I'm like, oh yeah, she used to be Marvel Girl. Because mm -hmm. everybody... It's just Jean Grey and Phoenix. Because that becomes the her Main. drawing factor. Yeah. is like, hey, she becomes Phoenix. Um, which I was surprised there wasn't really, there's like the smallest hint of a Phoenix connection in this, which I wouldn't even say is really, she just like at, at the end ha unleashes a, a lot of energy. Power, yeah. Yeah. But they don't, they don't dig into the Phoenix stuff like a lot of the other movies did. Um, yes. how old do you think they are? That is a good question. Cause I, as far as I can remember, there's no re, I mean, I would say, they kind of play to the ages from the comics. Like, Bobby's definitely younger, Iceman. It says Angel's the youngest in the script, which I thought was a weird choice. Is, is he, isn't he? is he younger on the team? Or is the he... Bobby's the youngest on the team. Yeah, well, normally. He, he's always like a teenager yeah, in the early but, days. Well, they're all technically supposed to be teenagers, like, in yeah. the beginning of the comic. Um, but they kind of, you know, they get older. But Like, I would say, I say, would say they do kind of come off a little young. Like, I would, I would say you'd be pushing it by saying Cyclops was in his early 20s. Yeah, yeah, I was trying to figure out because uh, Warren or Angel is running a company, which yeah. you see in one scene where he goes, sell stocks. Yeah, I'm like, Whoa. he's very stereotypical on the phone, like, buy this, <laughs> sell that, come on. And it's just like, and they're like, oh, and how do you run a company? And he's supposed to be the youngest. Yeah. Uh, so I thought that was very strange, but I guess, you know, he just inherited it from his dad or something. But yeah, I was trying to figure it out because they, like, Xavier says at the school, um, or that it's disguised at the school like it is normally. Yeah. But you get none of that even. We're teaching these kids. They are just no, the X-Men. Yeah. yeah. And there's no other mention of other students in the school. Yeah. It's, it's just these characters. Yeah, and they're, yeah, no, no even like kind of education. They're just the X-Men. <laughs> no. So And we never see them in a class or learning. We see a danger room scene like yeah. once or twice. Like we see Logan in the danger room when he finally gets recruited. And then we see like a team danger room scene. But other than that, there's there's no lessons. There's no classrooms. You think back to the first movie, they show Kitty Pride, who was kind of the main focus of that first movie. She's in multiple classes in that movie. You like Rogue. we see Rogue. Sorry, damn God. it. Um, we see um, multiple classes happening. We see Xavier teaching a class, and in this, it's just like there's like six people living in this school, and that's it. Yeah, and they don't see. And they're just literally their entire focus is being X Men. Yeah, like. It's one. It's weird to think about these older comic book movies. Like when me and Zist did Spider Man and stuff. It's like filmmaking is just different now, and you can definitely see that. Like, oh, they in in the X Men movie we got, they populated a school, but in this, it's very like they go big on some things. The way something like the the final battle scene is written very big for oh, like yeah. a '90s movie. Like I look at this, I'm like, man, thinking of the technology they had back then, it'd be really hard to see how they're gonna pull this off. But then they like really condense the movie in other places by like not having any other students in the school. But that's how I mean that's they really do go back to the beginning of the X Men comics when there were only there were only the five people there. Yeah, and we we see that a little bit in like First Class and mm -hmm. um, Days the, of Future the Past. Really beginning. Up. Yeah, it's like there's literally just like Xavier and Beast hanging out in this mansion in those movies. So yeah. not completely unprecedented, but it is a little different from what I'm what we're used to from the other movies. From the, yeah, the universe that the movie were. The current movies where, yeah, this is a school, they're learning, they're also learning about their powers, which isn't yeah. a big thing in this either. They seem to know their powers, they're just practicing. Yeah, the, the, they've definitely been doing this for a little while. Like, whenever the X-Men do finally get brought up by, like, the news or the government or while, it's implied that they've been around for, like, a little while, at least. That's also a, a thing that this movie is missing. Um, that's a common X-Men trope that is control. That mutants yeah. can't control their powers, and Rogue really does that job in the first movie yeah absolutely but here everyone's good to go everyone's got yeah. pretty good at their powers they can make you know ice balls and throw them at people and yeah i mean even if you think back they like in this they talk about how ice man does completely cover himself in ice which is something we don't even see until the third movie mm -hmm. and then in the second movie you got a lot of gene having trouble controlling her powers like that is a common thing throughout the movies 
And then, and then Cyclops, obviously, with his eyes, which is yeah, kind that of... Yeah, that is... I guess that part would be... Yeah, nice. that's kind of the only thing we get in this. Um, uh, well, moving on from, like, the the bad guys, we get introduced to a small military... I don't want to say faction, but, like, group led by this guy, uh, Guy Rich, I think is his name. Mm-hmm. And the Pale Man and the Tan Man are just two guys that show suits. up. Yeah, two suits that kind of have one scene... But and then we got Trask, who did make it into the movies eventually, played by Peter Dinklage, and they're kind of like our military bad guys in the movie. And I have a problem with these guys in the same way I had a problem with the movie X Men Apocalypse. Whereas if you think of Apocalypse, there's the scene where Apocalypse links with Xavier and launches all the nukes into space, mm-hmm. and then the mansion gets destroyed, and then military guys just show up for. No reason. I mean, they give you the faintest reason in the movie of like, oh, we just detected the world's most powerful psychic launching missiles from here. I'm like, why the fuck are you guys here? Yeah, just- That scene really bugged me in Apocalypse. It was literally just so they could cram Wolverine into the movie. And it's kind of the same thing in this movie. They just, the, we introduce them kind of early on. And then there's the encounter with the Brotherhood. And then Sentinels just show up at the mansion. And it's kind of the same yeah. thing. It They wanted to get this military. They wanted to get the sentinels in there obviously but it is a weird and it takes place at a weird time in the movie where they pretty much just distract the x-men from dealing with the brotherhood to me it feels exactly like the scene in x-men apocalypse because that scene just distracts from them going after apocalypse in egypt and that was a weird correlation that i drew between this script and that movie like to me it, it takes place kind of in the same part of the apocalypse movie and it serves the same purpose yeah, they're, it, they're pretty much the same. Yeah, and it's just time filler, and we're going to cram in Sentinels. There is one line during the part where they um, are when they finally beat the Sentinels, which is kind of near the end. Do you know what I'm talking about? I, th- I think so, like vaguely. I don't uh, know if I have a note on that. So the guy says, um, God, uh, Trask says, like, the beauty of them is they take care of, they learn themselves, you know, or something to that effect. And then Guy Rich, uh, after they get defeated, and they're, I just imagine it like a cartoon, like they're under a pile of junk. Yeah. He repeats the line in a sarcastic tone. And I'm just like, huh, are they supposed... And that just made me think, like, are they supposed to be comically in yeah. bad guys? It was just a weird little... There was, Yeah, there was a little bit of disconnect there of like, I don't understand what these characters are trying to accomplish. I mean, aside from... Kill killing all mutants, or ca- yeah. tattoo them, put them in concentration. Yeah, yeah aside from like, let's Nazi up these mutants. But, yeah, the whole way that scene wraps up of, like, oh, they just, like, somebody literally launches a sentinel, like, way out of this woods and onto their trailer, and then they capture all these military guys and wipe their minds and, like, dump them in, like, a grocery store parking lot or something. In Jersey, yeah. Yeah, like, it's just this, that whole scene is just this weird distraction, and, like, it definitely feels like, oh, we got to cram in Sentinels because that's a big thing for X-Men, which, hey, they would have done it before this series did because it took us all the way until Days of Future Past before we got a real Sentinel. Yeah, it's it was strange. And the strange thing is, at that same time, where they're finding these bad guys that are, you know, dangerous but maybe a little cartoonish and apt even a little bit, uh, the Brotherhood is destroying New York. Yeah, like... Destroy. They talk about destroying bridges and blocking up tunnels, and they basically. I can't imagine how they could have done those effects in 1994. Yeah, but if they had done it, it would have been amazing because it sounds. I mean, yeah, they really create a really interest. I mean, we're jumping way ahead at this point, yeah. but they really create a very interesting end battle and like they completely like destroy they for their fighting in like a destroyed new york and they've completely walled it off and claimed it for mutants and that part was awesome and there's a couple moments like this through the scene like jumping back a little earlier um the first encounter so magneto tries to recruit logan at niagara falls yes and saber is there and they actually have like kind of a cool fight scene and they're wearing suits yeah and of course because everybody should be wearing suits or armor and I re- I actually really like that action scene. Like, the way they described it, the idea of them fighting at this restaurant at the Niagara Falls, and Magneto just kind of, like, everyone runs out, and Magneto just, like, stands up. He's, like, the one person at a table. It's a little cheesy, but, like, yeah, he, uh... it, it paints a picture that I'm into, and I, I actually really like that action scene. Yeah. Well, uh, Sabretooth says one of his cheesy lines when he throws an espresso Always machine. Cheesy. Yes. Something like, well, after dinner, espresso, yeah, <laughs> throws like, an espresso machine. Literally every line of dialogue for him is terrible. <laughs> yeah, he does not seem menacing at no. all. 
and they try to make Blob a little sympathetic, just because like he's you know, dumb dumb. Yeah, he's just a he's just an idiot. But then they also do things where they like have him jump out of a plane onto another plane, and it's just like. For man, nineteen ninety four. I like. I'm trying to think. Like you got like movies coming out in ninety five, like Jurassic Park. So like special effects were catching up. Not, but I, that's I can't, what this script was writing. No, they really wrote this big, and I would love to see what it would have become because I think it it could have been a good movie. Like it would at the time, it probably would have blown us away. Um, depending on yeah, you know, or it could have looked. It would have been after Batman depending Returns. On, depending on the budget. It could yeah. also look like a computer-generated mess. Yeah, like this movie would have came out around the same time as like Batman Forever. Because Batman Forever was like 94, 95. And yeah. I think Batman Returns was like 92. I don't know if there were any other comic book movies in between there. But there's really not the kind of special, like actual special effects in those Batman movies. No, not at That all. would have to be in this movie. No, like the closest thing in Batman Forever is like the end when they're in the boat and the ship. But most of that's just like... They're on sets or yeah. they're in a prop plane and they just have like a projected background or something like that. I can't imagine doing even that plane stunt with the blob. Where he'd fall through a plane. Yeah, that would yeah. be. Or even Iceman's powers. Like, I would love to see what it would have looked like just for like, I feel like it'd be one of those things to pull out your collection and be like, hey, guys, remember when X-Men was like this? And just like kind of laugh and have fun with the cheesiness. Now us in 2017. Yeah, because he like straight up freezes people yeah like turns and, they, into ice th- and they talk about him turning into complete ice yeah, and i don't i'm glad i'm honestly glad it didn't come out just because yeah. you wouldn't have got the one that we did get yeah and you know i i don't know how you feel about that first movie to me i think it's a i think it's a good superhero movie to me that one's a little boring like I'm, it's the one i'm least likely to watch like if you were to offer me up those movies i might even go x3 over that one just because I'm not gonna say it's a good movie, but there's there's some there's some scenes I like in X three. To be honest, the original one is probably my favorite. Really? Over X two? Uh I love X two, but something especially those first couple scenes like Rogue and Wolverine on the road, finding everything out. I just there's there's something about it I just love. I mean, I I think the first movie is good. Yeah. Um the third movie is bad. Mm-hmm. But I and, really like that scene in three where Magneto's flipping the cars and crushing them and stuff. And there's some the fight scene with Wolverine in the woods. Um, but I mean, if you're going to ask me my favorite from the original movies, it'd be X2. If you're going to ask me my favorite overall, it'd be Days of Future Past. And one would definitely fall somewhere in the middle for me. That sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I just peeked at my notes and I can't believe I didn't think of this sooner. But the only thing I even wrote down for this scene is Mel Gibson. <laughs> Yes, I love that so much. <laughs> I I would love to have seen this if they actually had gotten him. So there's a scene where Beast and Xavier are driving to the city. Beast is his driver, and they get pulled over by a cop. And obviously, Beast, looking the way he does, is like, hey, you know, can you help me out to Xavier? And so the cop walks up to the window, and instead of seeing Beast, he sees Mel Gibson and gets out of a ticket by being Mel Gibson. I find it so funny because instead of having like Xavier like do, do pretty much a Jedi mind trick on him like yeah. hey we weren't speeding get out of here. Yeah. He convinces him as Mel Gibson. <laughs> yeah. Like hey man I've been really busy today to help a brother <laughs> out kind of thing. Yeah. I'm like why are you making this more complicated? I feel like this was the writer just being like man I'd love to work with Mel, Mel Gibson. Gibson and I feel like if I write this part he might be in the movie and I get to work with Mel Gibson. And it's, it's like you think of any movie that has like a celebrity cameo it's hardly ever the person they get in the movie is yeah. the first choice and i would love to, it's just one of those things it's like he who obviously wanted mel gibson but who would they have got you know like hey, maybe mel gibson at the time he was a really big star though so i i'm not seeing it but i would love to have seen who would have done this like 30 second cameo <laughs> And just the idea of reading something like that in a script, I laughed so hard. Like, what? Yeah, <laughs> That was basically the the reaction I expected when I brought that up. Um, yeah. Um, so it's like, this movie, it, it goes a little long, and I'm trying to get all my notes together. Um, like, what, I can, did you, what did you... Oh, sorry, did you have to... I, I said, if you were going to think of your favorite... Uh, I was trying to think of something to say. I'll just read my favorite line that Sabretooth says. <laughs> Is that a way... He says to Wolverine, 
is that the way you talked your old spying partner? Oh my god, yeah. That was a fair a really bad expositional line. I feel like most of the conversations between Wolverine and Sabretooth are for pure exposition. Like, yeah. we need to we set up how together. we used to know each spying other. Partner. Yes, that was... God, every line he has is bad. Like, I just... This person just was not... Click- what's this? Is uh, Andrew Kevin Walker, I think is his name. Um, he just does not seem to understand the character of Sabretooth. No. Um, how did you feel about the characterization of, like, the different X-Men? Like, to me, I felt he pretty much nailed Iceman because you just got to have, like, a kind of bumbling kid a little bit. Yeah, I mean, there wasn't... You barely got Angel. He's making deals, and he's got wings, yeah. and apparently he's incompetent. Yeah, he they really and like they break his wings and they're like, yeah, yeah he may never fly again. They may like, never Aw. heal. And then like, let's just admit that this is a shitty character that we need to write out of the franchise. It was, it was, yeah, very strange to how he was treated. It was like, why is he here? Yeah, it definitely felt like, oh, well, we have to have him because he's one of the core X Men. But let's just get rid of him. Yeah. Um, um, Cyclops, I thought was good being the leader, but also doubtful and yeah. Um. Beast was a little weird for me because they kind of turned him into a wise cracking. I mean, is he like that in the comics? Yeah, he, he is. is? But, okay. Um, some of the stuff was a little weird. He kind of became a fact machine too at some points, like just yeah. spouting off really weird like facts. Um, like he qu- in in one little dialogue moment, he quotes like multiple books from multiple authors. Where it's like we get it, like Beast is a genius, but it just came off a little braggy. <laughs> Yeah, he's kind of he can be like a little sarcastic, he kind of jokey, but not. It didn't come off the same way as it did in the comics, yeah. at least. I mean, most of the X Men comics I've read, which is granted not as many as you, or I haven't read that many. It's like Beast is always the super serious. Maybe I'm just reading the very serious X Men comics, but he's always really serious. And the time period that you're probably reading from, totally, where he's kind of yeah. more monstery. Yeah, and he's always in his lab working on something. And yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a definitely a time where he's darker, but I'd say especially during the time period this comic is looking into, it would make sense for him to be a little more goofier. Okay, yeah. See, I've just never encountered any beast stuff like that, and to me, it was just coming off like a little much. It, it was, I think, partially because it wasn't some of that stuff wasn't written. Great. Yeah, um, Logan was kind of the same for me. He seemed a little more useless in this. He got knocked out really a lot. F- fast and a lot. And- he he healed quick, but he didn't have the yeah. kind of stamina that you'd expect Logan to have. It's like, yeah, he got shot, hit in the head, and he was he's just down and out. Yeah. Versus, I, now I will say this: if you think back to X two, <coughs> there's the scene where they go to Bobby's house and the police show up, and Wolverine gets shot in the head, and he's down for a little while. Mm-hmm. And then you watch like X three and Days of Future Past, and he's just getting tore up by machine guns or cut up by stuff, and he's just brushing it all Fine. off. Yeah, like so. I will leave, I will say even in the movie franchise they kind of stretch that a little bit and change it around but But he got knocked out like four times in the script. Yeah, in the script he's almost like completely inept. And just his characterization like yeah, him being in a suit. I'm like I don't ever want to hear about Wolverine in a suit. My Wolverine wears a leather jacket or yeah, some yellow shirt, spandex. Or, yeah. But no suit and body armor. Yeah, I mean, like at one point when he's riding his Harley he's got like a flannel shirt. Yeah, I like. yeah. I mean I don't know. I just, I felt like, I feel like the movies that we got kind of, I don't want to say they nailed it because Wolverine's definitely way more gruff and like he's a fucking outdoorsman in the comics and stuff. And in the movies, I think as they went on, Hugh Jackman got more into that. Like by the time they hit Days of Future Past, I think he's nailed it. But in those early movies, he's a little too cleaned up and he's obviously not as like huge as he got for the rest of the movies. Yeah. But I just feel like it was one of those things like as he went on, he filled the role more and more. I get, yeah, I would agree with that. He looks he's more grizzled, you know, like, yeah, but, but in this movie, he's a little inept. He's, I would say, more sentimental. Absolutely. Um, it was, but we never really understand why he's sentimental. I mean, it, it's 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 just about the lost memories. Which yeah, is, which is it's the lost memories take two um, routes, which I find very strange. It's he has fractions of memories, which include yes. a field and the very classic X Men like Weapon X scene where he's got the yeah. tubes underwater. Yeah, like, we we, we get a straight up Weapon X moment in this movie. Yeah, which we didn't get until Apocalypse and. 
the current franchise. Yeah, it was great. But um, <laughs> and then also a box of photos. Yeah, which where did these photos come from? That's the thing. He was in the woods naked and hunting animals. Like yes. he, like and he like says that and everything. Like he was a monster and then this um Department H took him in and So are we to believe that Department H gave him this box of photos? Yes. So <laughs> Yes. That's one thing. I did. So he has this box of photos and he's like, um, they're basically like locations and things like people and stuff. None of and them he, are him. No. And he's trying to find out who he is by trying to find these locations and these people in these photos. And then he bends the corners of each one that he's checked out and none of them are leading to anything. And then we learn later in this really weird scene where Xavier and Jean go into his head and we get Wolverine fighting memory Wolverine that makes a whole lot of no sense. Ooh, memory Wolverine guy also sounded crazy looking. He started like yeah, he spice like, came out of his body. And yeah, like, he basically becomes like Doomsday from. It was very strange. Um, but yeah, well, we find out that the memories are fake. That yes. he's been had his memory wiped a bunch of times, which checks out, and that they gave him this box, I guess, to like. And Department hey, H you might have these memories, I guess, to keep yeah. him under control. Well, I think so because Department H, uh, they showed him because he has his memory. He thinks of a field of flowers, and he's trying to like find that field of goddamn flowers. He wants to find yeah. it so bad. The field and of flowers he- comes up multiple times finds out it's just a tv pretty much a- yeah it was like a tv so like xavier and gene are in his head and for some reason they can see his memories in a 3d space and they can see that it's just a projector and that we we see people from department h are kind of the ones who are like feeding him these memories so i'm guessing to also work on that they gave him just a box of photos. yeah and i guess like hey <laughs> this weird- will keep you guessing yeah. like what the Fuck. Try to figure this out. Like, <laughs> what, a, like, what a bunch of assholes. <laughs> yeah, it was a real dick yeah, move. But I do like the box of photos leads us to a really good character moment, I think, where Jean, it, it's kind of a weird setup, but I like the payoff, where she goes through the security footage and gets like a picture of all them together and basically like takes a screenshot of it and prints it out and puts it in his box. And that whole the roundabout way she gets to it is kind of like, all right, whatever. Yeah, I, I, thought that I, I was trying to figure out what she was doing. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, like I don't, what I don't are you searching it. for, yeah, lady? It, it kind of just comes out of nowhere. But I do like the payoff of that scene where later she goes and looks in his box and all the other photos are gone and he only kept the photo of the X-Men. It's a little Aww. cheesy, a little daytime TV, but... It's a nice character moment. It shows that he is growing as a character and that he has accepted that these X-Men are now his family. Uh, another I thought was very, thing that I thought was very strange but was another Wolverine character growing moment was when uh, Professor X tells him he's out of the X-Men. Yeah, that was really weird. So Xavier kind of does this. He does two weird moments like this. And this is, this is going to lead into the scene that I was talking about that kind of bogs down the movie a little bit in the middle. Um We got all this shit going on. Like, the Brotherhood is kind of in the shadows. These military guys are in the shadows. And they decide to vote for who the new leader's going to be in this really long, boring scene of everybody voting. And they have to, like, go off and, like, think about it. Yeah. It's like, oh, we're going to reconvene and we're all going to vote again. And we go through the votes and obviously Wolverine votes for himself. And they go through the votes and you find out, oh, two people voted for Wolverine. And that leads us to another character building moment where we find out that Cyclops, which is the person who is voting, like they're voting for Wolverine or Cyclops to be the new leader. Cyclops also voted for Wolverine. Like he's lost faith in himself. I thought the scene was dumb. I thought it was interesting to see Scott's doubt a little bit. I, I do too. I agree. And it, to me, it's the same thing with like the photo in the box. Like, the path there is awkward, but the payoff is a good moment. Yeah, because you see that Scott's kind of belief in himself was due to Professor X's belief, and he feels yeah. like his belief wavering, and it just a little yeah. bit of doubt. Yeah, and again, Xavier's kind of an asshole to him, where he's like, you know, somebody suggests voting for a leader, and instead of Xavier squashing that shit, he's just like, no, yeah, let's yeah, vote for all- a leader. Well, Reen suggested the new guy. <laughs> yeah, the fucking guy who's been here for five and, minutes. And the best part is, no one obviously wanted him to be the leader because no, no one, no one voted for him except for Cyclops and himself. And Wolverine's just like, oh, you can't win them all. Like, the whole scene doesn't go anywhere. Like, it gives us the moment, it gives us the Cyclops moment, which I like. Just like- and also a weird Gene Wolverine moment too, though. Yeah, where he's like. You won't just be voting for a leader. Like, if you vote for me, it's a vote for me he, to be your boyfriend. Yeah, he comes off a little rapey against Gene. 
Like, and I mean, they've always kind of had that animalistic attraction to each other and like yeah. in the comics and you the want the bad boy stuff. don't you yeah and in this movie it just comes off he's real pushy and she's into it for like a second but then it's just like that's no. another part where i was thinking about the age thing i'm like how old is everyone here yeah and yeah in high school i mean we know wolverine his story he could be like 200 years old we don't know he says he could be 30 and that also made me wonder about does he think that oh, he says i could creepy. be 30 i could be 100 i was like yeah how old are you? <laughs> yeah. And I don't know. Oh, that's so creepy. Yeah, he wasn't. Um, yeah. So actually, I was going to ask you this question, but then I kind of had this answered for myself today when I was reading an X-Men comic. I don't remember Magneto ever being referred to as Magnus before. Um, and then I was reading House of M earlier today, and Magnus is also comes up there. Yeah. Is that his... Is that actually his, his name? His middle name. It's his middle name. Because even in the script, because I was... He's not often, I think, especially in the newer comics, never referred to. I mean, like House of M, maybe because that's kind of a weird alternate world. But yeah, and that one's been retconned at this point. But I, I, I was actually trying to remember if I was thinking about it because of the movies, and they did use that in the comics. I don't know why it kind of. To me, this was the first time I ever remember it standing out to me, and then that's what made it weird. Yeah, because they they definitely don't use it in any other movies, no. and. It, it, it was weird that I, I saw it in this script and then I was reading House of M, which came out in like 2008, somewhere and somewhere, maybe around that range. Mm -hmm. So it's a little older. And yeah, and all of a sudden I'm seeing it pop up in that book and I'm just like, I don't remember this ever being part of his name before. It's one of those things that when I read it, it made me doubt. I was like, do they ever use this? I There was a clone of him. Was that guy's name Magnus? I don't know. <laughs> if I start talking about clones. X-Men yeah. stuff gets yeah. so weird. Doesn't he get younger at some point, That's too? That's a clone. That's a clone? Okay, yeah. X-Men's so Falls weird. Uh, it, it's part of it's the great, reason I weird. read it for so long, and then in the past couple of years, I have fallen off just because yeah. I it's so much easier to read trades than try to keep up with like a weekly yeah, pull list. Yeah, and that's, that's what I'm at, is I'm trying to find a good series to read where I can just start getting the trade paperbacks and try to dig into it. And yeah. I'm I'm just kind of lost on some of this stuff. I just, whenever the, someone says this is a really good trade, I'm like, all right, I'll read that. I'm not going to be following yeah, that, every X-Men series. I mean, for me, it's like, oh, this stuff went on sale on the app. So I'm like, oh, I'll pay three ninety nine for a book that's normally 15 So yeah, I'm like, that makes sense. yeah, so that's kind of where I've been digging into. Um, but, you know, while they're voting on this leader, that's when the Brotherhood is basically taking over New York. Because, God forbid, anybody pay attention to what's going on there. No. Um, and we do... <laughs> we get a name drop of Trump Tower, which I yes, <laughs> and a Trump helicopter. Yes, where Sabretooth steals a helicopter. We got Sabretooth stealing helicopters, Toad stealing fire trucks. They're blowing up tunnels and flooding tunnels and taking down bridges, and they basically turn New York City into an island. And they're like, "This is where mutants are now." Yeah, like we got a couple bridges left. Get out while you can. Yeah. Apparently, Otherwise there were no mutants already in New York, which I thought. I thought like, "Oh, cool, we're gonna get." A bunch of new mutants introduced. That was something I also found very interesting was I was trying to figure out how big is the mutant population in this X-Men universe. It doesn't seem very big. Like, because you got to think that New York has a fucking how many people? Like a couple million for yeah. sure, just in the city. And they're... You don't see a single other no, mutant besides... No, it's the implied that everybody's leaving. So you're telling me there's not one mutant just hiding out in New York somewhere? There's... The Brotherhood, there's the X-Men, and then there's one guy with four arms at the beginning of the movie. Yeah, that's the that's the entire list of mutants we get from this whole movie. Yeah. And they do imply that, like, after... So Magne they take over New York, and Magneto makes this announcement on TV, and they imply that mutants are flocking to New York, but they never reach there. They're never mentioned again. There's no even hint of another mutant in this movie. We don't, like, cut to another mutant. No. It's not like, oh, mutants watching on TV around the world. And like, yeah, we like what this guy's saying. We're going to go there. It's just like, no. It's like, oh, apparently somebody's watching on satellite that there's mutants flocking to New York. But, eh, they don't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, in the meantime, we've got to fight Sentinels. Because deal with Sentinels. Yeah, it's like, so they're at the mansion, and the Sentinels just, like, appear. And we've got three of them. They follow the tracker. Because they, at one point, uh, they captured Beast. Yes, Beast got captured. and They track him. Yeah, and he escapes. So he... Which was kind of a, like Beast gets captured and he's just like the military guy, Guy Rich and um, what's his name, Trask. Mm. They have him in their lab 
and he they're like torturing him and experimenting on him. And they mention Trask taking his blood, but they never say what it's for. Trask is supposed to make a bunch of mutants. Yeah, that's right. And he's gonna get a hundred thousand dollars per makes, mutant he no. makes. I'm like, what are you what are you doing? This made no sense. So it's like implied that, oh, the government and the military hates mutants, but they want to create their own mutant army. Yes. So that makes that was that this is one of those 90s things where it's like, of course, we have to have this bad guy plan and it it doesn't really make sense in the universe of X-Men or the world we're creating. But whatever, we're just going to do it anyway. There's another other world building one that doesn't make sense, except that it's 90s. Uh, Professor X implies that mutants exist because of pesticides. Does he really? He says something totally near the beginning. That. He goes, "Oh, you expect there not to be mutants when there's all these like chemicals and we're feeding each other." Chem- like, oh yeah. Some like, and then he mentions pesticides. I'm like, huh? Not very X Men. Yeah. But kind of nineties. I always liked. I liked in first class when I always like when they call them the children of the atom. Like I like the idea that like oh mutants didn't really become a thing until we invented the atomic bomb. Although that doesn't really make sense because then. Eric uh, Magneto, he was in, in yeah. World War Two, So I guess that doesn't really make sense. There, well, there's always been mutants because of Apocalypse. Yeah. But, so, I mean, if you really but it starts to back. get more. There's more yeah. mutants. You know, there's yeah. always been mutants, but now all of a sudden. Like that was something in First Class, the movie that they touched on. It was like, oh, the, the children of the atom. Like the, the atomic age brought forth mutants and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and Rather than pesticides. Yeah. I don't know. Pesticides is not going to do it for me. Um. Yeah, so this leads us into the big final battle in New York, which um, I, I like it. I, I actually really like the battle they create. It gets a little, I don't want to refer to it as 90s, but it's very early filmmaking. Like, oh, everyone gets in. They have this really kind of ridiculous scene where they're all trapped in Magneto's, like, Big ball of metal. Yeah, he's like pushing all this metal on top of them, and Jean's formed a barrier, and they end up going underground. And they end up getting split up, and we don't really know how they get split up. I think they hit. <laughs> there's a funny there's scene a... where they're digging underground, and Wolverine's just kind of like, "Uh oh, I hit a gas pipe." <laughs> it's just filling up with gas, and they're like, "Oh shit, what do we they do have now?" A giant sunny bubble full of gas, and it's like, "All right." <laughs> I thought that I, th- I thought that was kind of a fun scene, and then yeah, that leads to them. Wolverine's useless. Yeah, for pretty much. Like, seriously, in the movies, they put so much credibility on Wolverine as a character. And in this, he's just getting knocked around all the time. He never really wins a fight. That, That's not too I don't great. think he ever wins a single fight in this movie. And he's just kind of an idiot. Oh, um, the thing before the final battle I want to talk to is the Professor X tells Wolverine he's out of the X-Men. Yes, yeah. So, um, we, sorry, we touched on that earlier. He pretty much goes like... Get out of here, kid. You're not yeah. wanted here anymore. They're like literally Take getting ready. Get out. They're literally boarding the helicopter to leave. And he's just like, oh, by the way, uh, you're out. And then like two seconds later, he was like, JK, I was just testing you. And I'm like, what a fucking <laughs> prick. That's so weird. I'm like, and it, and he's like, really? Right now? Is think when about you how that? you felt when I told you were in, how you felt like you lost yeah. everything. I'm like, what are you doing, <laughs> Professor X? <laughs> this, this is not the time for that, <laughs> like, that moment. Oh, God, yeah, that was really fucking weird. I was so confused. I was reading because I'm like, is he out? What is Professor X doing? And then I'm yeah. like, oh, his actual plan is somehow worse. Yeah, like, I'm I'm serious. He is an asshole in this script. And I know he can be in the comics, but, like, it was... He's an unhinged asshole. That's yeah. a terrible plan. Yeah, it's almost like he's torturing them to teach them a lesson. Yeah, because it, it, he's, like, he's trying to be manipulative, but he's bad at it. Yeah. Oh, God. Such an asshole. Um... Yeah, so that that leads us to them in New York. Everybody's separated, and everybody's kind of got who they're going to fight. Wolverine is obviously fighting Sabretooth at the stock exchange, because what a better place to put two animals fighting each other. And if you think Sabretooth isn't going to ring that bell, he <laughs> rings sure that bell. He sure does. Oh, God. And they're just throwing TVs at each other, <laughs> and Wolverine's just getting his ass kicked, and Saber, they uh, that, that fight kind of really goes nowhere. We we get more of a fight, so I think it's Juggernaut is going after... Or no, Iceman is with Blob. And he ends up freezing yes. him in a fountain, which I thought was kind of fun. And then Blob starts crying because he's like a baby. <laughs> um, Juggernaut is with Cyclops? 
Yes. But then Bobby comes in on that Bobby fight. comes up helping everyone out pretty much. Yeah, too. Bobby's kind of the hero of the movie. Yeah, <laughs> like, right at the end. He's like, why don't we just freeze all these guys? And yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, because they end up freezing Juggernaut and uh, Scott shoots his helmet off, basically, and he just, like, knock, gets knocked My out. My helmet? Yeah, I'm done. Which Juggernaut is one of those characters I have not really encountered in the comics, so I don't know how they... He's one of those guys where his power is just like, how do you stop this guy? And I've never really read any of the comics where he's popped up, so I don't know how they often stop him in the comics. So it's, Yeah, pretty much the whole thing on Juggernaut is he doesn't stop, so you gotta yeah. stop. Like, that's... Yeah. <laughs> so it's stuff like, you know, freeze him in ice. Take, or uh, they end up usually going to take his helmet off because yeah. he's immune to psychic powers with the helmet. Yeah, that's... I, I mean, I've seen him in, like, some of the cartoons and stuff. Yeah. So that's usually how I how it ends up going, as far as I can tell. But, yeah, and he's one of those characters that's just like, how do you stop this guy? Um, Not Professor X's half-brother in this, I'm guessing. No. Is, is that from the comic? So that... I was always wondering, is that is that canon? Is that how I it always if it's is? Stepbrother or half brother, but yeah. So they are that is actually from the comics. Yeah, they might be stepbrother. I think I saw that in one of the cartoons. I'm like, is this just for the cartoon? Is this for the comics? No. I really need to get up on my X Men. Um oh, yeah. So Toad, he's squared off with Gene and Beast, I believe. Yeah. He's trying to he's trying to spit on Beast and yeah. Beast is not having it. Dude. Yeah. Oh, Beast was also fighting Juggernaut at one point. Yeah, they they do start to switch a little bit, you yeah. know. And Everybody kind of comes to when together. they get the advantage, yeah. Um, and Magneto just kind of sitting this out, and then he kind of shows up at the end, and then he this was so this was weird. He gets Scott, and he like is holding him, and he takes off his glasses, and apparently Scott just can't close his eyes. And this <laughs> one, no, because they say even when he finally gets his eyes closed, there's still beams coming out. Yeah. So apparently he struggles to close his eyes, which sounds yeah inconvenient yeah because i mean in the other movies it's just like hey just keeps his eyes closed and it's fine but yeah and this it's just wildly shooting and i'm just like why doesn't he just close his eyes the whole time instead of kill his team yeah and i just i i don't know i thought that could have been handled a little better um and, and we do get kind of a scene where it's like to defeat magneto it's kind of like everybody kind of uses their powers at once like wolverine ends up letting Sabretooth go. Like, he doesn't end up finishing that, does he? No, Sabretooth uh, jumps into a river, I feel like. Yeah, and there's they do this thing where... So Wolverine and Sabretooth get split up. Sabretooth is running away. Wolverine does the scene where he looks at the X-Men, looks at Sabretooth, and then he goes after Sabretooth. And then Sabretooth jumps in the, in the river or on a boat or something, and then they do the same thing. He stops, he looks towards Sabretooth, looks back again. I'm like, do we really have to do this twice? Apparently we do, because he changes his mind. <laughs> yeah, and then he changes his mind and goes back. And then, yeah, he sneaks up on Magneto, and then they all kind of combine their powers or whatever, and that's kind of the end of it. Then Wolverine says, you're under arrest. Yes. <laughs> As if they have any authority to re- arrest you anybody. You are also terrorists in this world. But don't <laughs> worry, because they hand them over to the government, and the government still says they're terrorists. Yeah. Like I was like, what the fuck, man? You can't even cut them a break? Like, they just, like, New York, this is a they saved very yeah. horrible yeah. thing that has happened, and they saved it. And they're like, nope, terrorists. Unfortunately, they couldn't catch the X-Men, is what they say at the end. Yeah, and they, they straight up label them terrorists. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, that one was really weird to me. Um, But, yeah, I mean, I guess, that, I guess that pretty much covers the story of the script. Yeah, there's like, a quick wrap-up after they... Very quick. Yeah, and party. It, yeah, party, Wolverine's going to leave, and then he's like, oh, I'll be back. And then they just walk into the mansion, and it's just like, credits. Um, It's a very simple... X Men story. Yeah, um, it's it's your run of the mill, like you said, registration. Um, you Sentinels, get your yeah, you get your core characters. I see. I feel like the Sentinels are crammed in, just like Weapon X was crammed in an Apocalypse. I feel like that perfectly mirrors the cramming in of the Sentinels There's in this script. One female character in this movie. Yes, you're. We are not on a roll with female characters. No, it's a real long. <laughs> Um, Especially because there's so many great female X Men to use. Yeah, and even in the original X Men movie, you had Jean and Rogue. And, and Storm. Storm. Yeah. yeah, there's no... I thought... Was Storm one of the original? Yeah. I thought it was kind of weird that she was left out. And she was not one of the original X-Men. Because pretty much what happens in the original comics, I know you don't know the old stuff. Is, no, I don't. It's, uh, it's uh, Jean Grey, Cyclops, Beast, Angel, and Iceman. And then pretty much they, uh, they're they captured, and Professor X decides to get uh, the international X-Men pretty much together, what? which is Wolverine from Canada, <laughs> uh, Nightcrawler from Germany... Banshee from okay. Ireland, Storm from Africa, and uh, Thunderbird 
from the Native American. I recently learned about Thunderbird. I had never heard of him before. And yeah. then I, me and Chris were looking at a list of X-Men. It was around the time Apocalypse came out. We were looking at a list of characters like, who's this guy? Thunderbird. Yeah, yeah, he was one of the like first 10 X-Men. Yeah, see, I had never seen him before. In a cool costume. But, <laughs> so that's why pretty much they got the more in the second. The, so that's pretty much the second generation. So they yeah. went entirely first generation minus Wolverine. Because he's so cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they really seem scared not to have Wolverine. I mean, he's absolutely the most popular X Men. It's between him and Xavier, which I'll say Xavier actually gets a lot of action in this movie. There's multiple scenes of him crawling away from things, or him him crawling down from the Statue of Liberty. Yes, like that he gets is... left up at the top, and it's just like, what do I do now? <laughs> that was the craziest thing. Because okay, so there's what's a really cool scene with. I assume, like, I'm imagining visually of Magneto and Charles talking at the top of the Statue of Liberty. Yeah. And then Charles, I mean, Magneto, Magneto just leaves. leaves and, and leaves then him there. He's there lying on the ground with a foldable wheelchair that he then puts down a trap door <laughs> and starts sadly crawling down. Yeah. Like, it's, it's like, like what? the saddest moment. Like, oh, like, this guy, really? It's just so weird because, like, huh, I guess I'll have to get down. Let's show it. Yeah. And. <laughs> As far as X uh, Magneto and Xavier, that was one thing I thought the older the the, the current movies do really well is their relationship. Like, oh yeah, Chernobyl. Yeah, <laughs> I forgot about Chernobyl. We'll get to that. Um, there, so yeah, there's the scene. Again, this is this is one of the scenes I will defend in X three. After Xavier's killed in X three. And they're in the woods, and Pyro's like, I would have done it years ago if you would have let me. And Magneto stops and is like, Charles Xavier did more for mutants than anyone will ever realize. And my only regret is that he won't live to see this day. Like, that is one of the most perfect moments of their relationship out of that whole franchise. Yeah. And that I will always defend X3 just for that line. Because <laughs> that's one of the only things you can defend in that movie. Mm. Um, but I, I feel like their relationship is handled really well in the franchise we got. In this movie, it's it's implied that they're friends, but and there's there's like one really good conversation moment, but overall, you just don't get that feeling. No, there's yeah, they, I mean, they did work together. Apparently, they were aid workers together, and they yeah. said to be aid workers. They're like we're our own aid workers. Yeah, team. their background story is real rough. Yeah, they were volunteering in Israel, and then Chernobyl happened. And yeah. Magneto was the cause. Yeah, so Magneto caused Chernobyl, and that's why he's evil. Um, yeah, I mean. That that's one thing to me is one of the most important things you need in an X Men movie. And you think back to the first movie, like one of the opening scenes is Xavier watching the the Senate meeting or whatever, mm-hmm. the politician guy talking, and then he goes out and sees Eric, and they kind of share a moment. And I really like all that stuff in all the it's movies, great. and it's... even in when they bring in the new cast with uh, McAvoy and Fassbender, they nail that stuff. And that is just so absent in this script. Yeah, and they. They really don't, especially they don't get a final confrontation. No. And yeah, Xavier, he's not there at the final battle, which he's not usually in the other movies anyway, because he is kind of, you know, hey, I'll be back at Command yeah. Center and blah, blah, blah. And it's always implied that like, oh, Magneto's helmet is very important because if that comes off, Xavier can stop him. And his helmet comes off multiple times in this movie Nothing and it's never happens. an issue. Yeah, it's never even mentioned that that... No, there's no... Neither, neither helmets that are in this movie, it's implied that... Like, stop anything. They're just yeah. decorative. Yeah. Helmets. I mean, they really dropped the ball on that stuff. Um, but I mean, like, if this was the X Men movie we got at the time, I think it would have been okay. Like, I, I, I could have lived with this movie. It's not perfect, but it definitely could have been a, a first building block to something more. Yeah. I just wonder if it would have been, because I do think that the X Men movie that we did get was a stronger script. Oh, absolutely. What, and, and definitely it was in a better time period. Yeah. I don't even think had. The first one especially had any of these, like, big things. I'm trying to remember the big set pieces of, like... Of this script or that Oh, the one that ended up coming out. Oh, well, the fight on top of the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, but Um, it wasn't as big as what we saw in this. This is more akin to the third movie. And that's kind of why the first movie, to me, it gets a little boring, because there is no big moments. There's there's a few good action scenes, but overall, that movie just kind of glides through the paces. Mm -hmm. And it sets up the characters, and we have some really good character moments and stuff, but there's there's no real memorable action scenes from that first movie. Um, The second movie totally stepped it up. Yeah, a lot more Um, action in that. Yeah. And... Yeah, I mean, the first movie is definitely better story-wise and character-wise. And there are some good character moments in this. And like we said, there's some good dialogue. Like, we do get a few good team-building moments with, like, the Danger Room stuff. 
But the movies that we did get are a lot more true to the comics, and mm-hmm. th- they do a better job overall. I would say. I agree. But I do think if this movie came out in the mid '90s, I would have been okay with it. Yeah. Like, I don't know when the cartoon was running. It probably would have been around the same it, time. I believe it would have been around the same time. I could never tell with those cartoons when they were yeah. runs and when the show could have been over for years, and I still would have been watching it. Yeah, because I want to say it was on at the same time as the Spider-Man animated series, and that was like '95. I think so. the Spider-Man one was animated better, wasn't it? See, I didn't watch the X Men one okay. that much. It's it that show holds up. I will say, like, it's definitely for kids, but you can watch it now and still enjoy it. I just remember Sinister having a million teeth in the uh, yeah X Men cartoon. Yeah, see, yeah, and I just didn't watch the X Men cartoon, and I think it was on Netflix for a little while, and I was gonna try to watch it. I don't know if it still is. I Probably don't know if the original not. one was. Maybe it I th- was. I think oh. they did for a little while, because I think I put it on my queue, and then it I went loved X Men Evolution. Me too. So I got in during the movies and X-Men Evolution, Evolution came out. Right that time. I would love for that show. It, it was canceled way too soon because it only ran, I think, like three seasons. Speaking of the introduction of X-23. Was it? Was it came from that X- cartoon? From that cartoon. Which X-23 is a character recently, especially with Logan coming out, mm-hmm. which is the day that this podcast comes out is when Logan is out. I really want to learn more about X-23. I kind of know just the basic stuff. You should read the uh, NYX comics. NYX? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to look into art, that. And especially if you like anime, like art, check oh, those yeah, out. I'll be, I'll be into that. So NYX, I'll make a note of that. Um, yeah, is there anything else you want to cover about this movie? I think um, that was probably everything. Yeah, I mean, it, it would have been interesting. I oh, can definitely. say that. Um, the movies we got are 100% better, but I mean, it's coming at a much later time where the technology had caught up to the story of that they would have to tell yeah um but yeah thanks for sitting with me talk some x-men um i'm searching so hard for an earlier x-men script and if i get it, i'm Great. gonna have to bring you back i'm gonna to. dig deep for that one because there was one written before this and as far as i can tell is the earliest x-men movie so i want to get my hands on that cool but uh in the meantime thanks for sitting with me and mm-hmm. um as always anybody at home you can follow the show at on twitter at at shelved podcast and you can email the show at shelved film podcast at gmail.com and that's also our tumblr so you can go to shelf film podcast to see what the next script is going to be and so you can read along and be ready for the next episode but uh maggie thanks for joining me